What is up, metal and heavy music fans? It's time for Trench Talk, and I'm your host, Flight of Icarus, with MetalTrenches.com. As always, if you haven't already, please do subscribe to the channel and stick around because there's plenty more episodes. You can listen to this podcast on Spotify, iTunes, CastBox, BitChute, and YouTube, and there's plenty of other content on the YouTube channel as well. So regardless, definitely subscribe there. Today, I've got an interview with Tuomas of Wolfheart talking about their new album Wolves of Karelia and uh, I really enjoyed having the time to talk to him and I hope you enjoyed it as well so let's get into the episode Thomas from Winter Metal Band Wolfheart and I just kind of got into your band in 2018 with Constellation of the Black Light, which I was a huge fan of. But, you know, obviously there have been quite a few albums before then. So maybe you could sort of get me and the listeners up to speed as to how the band got started and all that. Uh, the band, band was uh, was born 2013. There's been quite a, not, not big, but a clear development with the music because the first album was kind of like solo album. It was just me in the studio playing all the instruments. And um, at least you can notice that from the tempos with the drums since uh, since I got Jonas to join the band on the on the second album, Shadow World. A uh, lot faster blast beats and, and double bass has been uh, mixed with the, with the music. And uh, we've been going from this like a um, semi like melodic semi death metal with gothic and doom influences into more like this scandinavian melodic black metal for and every album seems to be faster as we get older and crumpier so <laughs> that's, that's that's our approach things annoy us more uh, as human beings so we write faster music <laughs> that's interesting because sometimes i'll talk to people and i'll hear it the other way around it's like everything sort of slows down as they get older yeah. they're, they're less frustrated <laughs> that's what i've heard also and read about interviews and i don't understand because my life is just getting more fucked up well it's, it's now the virus thing of course naturally fucks everything up but uh but yeah it's, it's just been i i guess it's also like development of Jonas as a drummer because each album i do kind of ask him certain numbers could this and this uh, speed can be reached and uh, usually he just says like everything is everything is uh, something that he can just train so i take that as a challenge <laughs> it's always good to have challenges um you you mentioned that you know things besides the virus are kind of like fucked up right now are you willing to to kind of share what else has been sort of playing into that or is that more personal well, I, well, yeah, I, I, I guess I put that a little bit wrong. Everything would be okay if there wouldn't be the virus, but it's, it's fucking in so many layers, let's put it that way, because it's not just uh, affecting the music side, which is a huge impact, but also it's, it's, it's Finland is completely shut down, and it, I, I fear that it's going to have a lot of long-term effects also, especially in the music scene. Like yeah. the virus, we will, uh, we will uh, conquer the virus eventually, but... Uh, how how are different management and booking agencies and even record labels, a lot of venues, how they are going to survive? So it's the whole metal scene might look completely different in half a year or so. So yeah. Otherwise, and I, I think this whole virus thing puts a lot of things in perspective. Yeah, so. I'm I'm intrigued to see what comes out of it, honestly, because there's definitely a lot of negative, but I also see potential for, like you say, like the scene to look very different. And I don't think that necessarily has to be a bad thing, but people are definitely no. having to get creative. Yeah, that, that will push people to find a lot of new solutions. And uh, there's always something good out of something bad. It's just the way you look at it. But uh, of course, it's, uh, it, it creates a lot of challenges and there's a lot of people especially in the in the business side that you it's different to be creative when you are like songwriter you have a band you you're different kind of flexible but uh if your whole income is is running a venue that is going to be shut for uh, three yeah. or four months then then it doesn't it's not just about creativity but uh but then again it's also like uh the, each country has to support their own small businesses because if the, if we let all the businesses die, die it's going to be 
uh, different kind of economical crisis following. So I think this will bring people and businesses together also in a different way. Yeah. Have have you had like show cancellations already? I thought I saw something maybe about like a show with Rotting Christ that was supposed to be coming up or, you know, how's yeah. that going? The, the, we, we, I, I don't know which uh, city I should be right now, but uh, we should be in the second week of North American tour at the moment. Uh, so that whole thing, not, it didn't get canceled, it got uh, moved and we moved forward. Uh, for February and March 2021, but uh, at the moment for us it's equals that it was cancelled because the whole album uh, promo was built around the tour for North America. Yeah, and uh, then we lost all the gigs from May already. I'm pretty sure the summer is gonna look really empty, so it kind of like emptied the whole calendar. I think we lost like uh, 50 gigs so far. So it uh, a Jeez. lot of lot of. Uh, a lot of the promotion and, and all the scheduling was based, I and mean, actually we even timed the whole release of the album so it would be out for the tour. But uh, of course, like we just mentioned the getting creative in a different way, so now we just put a lot of more effort on uh, doing interviews and doing the promo since we are not doing the tour. Yeah. That was supposed to provide a lot of uh, publicity, at least in North America. So Yeah. I know a well, lot of be, bands too recently well, have been turning to like Twitch streaming shows and things like that. I don't know if that's something that you all have been thinking about or other we have, options. We have another option that we are actually not just kind of like work already out. We're going to have this uh, virtual gig that's going to be out in 9th of uh, April, just cool. day before the album comes out. We we shoot shot all the, already the, uh, the geek weird to talk about the it's, it's, uh, say that it was a gig because it, it was a weird weird evening we went to one of the the best venues we know in in, uh, in southern finland and we recorded the show with uh, 10 cameras and took the multi-truck audio and i'm gonna edit like this like a dvd digital file for people because uh, we we thought like this is too risky with the streaming at the moment because the quality of all, like even Netflix and YouTube have announced that they're going to lower the quality because way too many people are going to be online. Yeah, We have a lot of fans from completely different uh, time zones. That would be another challenge. And I already saw a few, uh, few like uh, streaming gigs and there's also one challenge is uh, since the person who is doing the cutting is doing it on the spot. And if, yeah. if he or she is not super on top of the game with the tempo and uh, the camera changes, it can get really uh, unprofessional looking and disturbing, at, at least to me. I, I've, been, I've been editing music videos for 10 years now, so maybe I'm a little bit too picky, but uh, but it, it's, it's going to be probably, now it's going to push a lot of musicians and bands to do this more direct interaction with the fans online, but yeah. the platform is not that ready yet for super professional like I, we wouldn't be able to stream anything full hd quality especially now with the the whole internet being overcrowded so i wouldn't want that to happen that people they pay the ticket or donation or whatever is the, the transaction there and uh, and we wouldn't be able to ensure the quality and also we kind of needed to do this to ticket sell because uh, we did lose a lot of money with the North American tour. We had the flights book, we printed over uh, 500 t-shirts, uh, the visas, tax waivers, uh, backline, bus advance payments. North America is expensive place to begin with. And if you pay everything that needs to be paid in advance and then don't get to go there and actually play the gigs and get the fees and, and sell the merchandise, that's uh, that can be quite a complicated thing. So. Now, now we have a geek that will help us a little bit with the financially, and we are still able to provide something exclusive and special for the fans, because there's not going to be any geeks for at least for a while now. Yeah, yeah, it's 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 definitely changed up like the entire game right now, and uh, like we've been saying, it, it'll be interesting to see how things play out. <laughs> yeah.
Yeah, let's turn to the album. So the new one's called Wolves of Corellia yeah. and through Napalm Records. And my understanding is that there's a pretty in-depth like concept behind this that you're interested in talking about. So maybe you could start sharing some more on that. Yeah, it's the, the whole album is based on the, the Winter War but that was fought between Finland and Russia during the Second World War. It was just, a, just basically a few months in, uh, in the winter, 1939 and 1940. It didn't play a huge role in the, in the, the whole, whole war and, uh, and the, the, like the history of the world, but it, it did have a huge impact on the Finnish independence and, and how we are as a country now. And uh, to a Finnish person, it is very inspiring like source for uh, lyrics and uh, inspiration and I've, I've been covered like there's been at least one or two songs on each album from that period of uh, Finnish history and uh, also in that region because Karelia is a, is a region in, in Finland where I was born and I spent my childhood and my father's family line has a farm there that has been standing for like a few hundred years and uh, the new border was drawn just seven kilometers from that farm and uh, so it, it's a, there's a, like this kind of like family connection for the region and also the, the historical. But even though it's a, the whole album is about that war and all the lyrics are based on the stories uh, of the veterans, uh, I didn't want to underline the, the war thing too much. So that's why it's not that clear in the title or the cover. We are not Sabaton. We, that's the, the Swedish have a different approach going very direct with the metal uh, like the the war metal theme but so I, I wanted to have it more in the stories inside the song not underlining too much because that kind of like wouldn't be our style and expand on that a little bit more like where maybe is there like a favorite point on the album that kind of tells elements of that story that you're particularly passionate about uh, I think this, uh, the, the chorus of the, the song called Reaper would probably underline it the best. It's, uh, uh, now I'm having a weird artist block because I don't remember my own lyrics. Uh, <laughs> Happens to uh, the best of us. Uh, facing an enemy, um, I don't, God damn, I need to actually find the lyrics. Well, that the lyrics are <laughs> actually not even the point. The whole, the, this one thing that was the, the biggest, like, uh, is source of inspiration and what is the, the actually in, even in the war history is quite uh, remarkable is that uh, how badly Finnish army was outnumbered and still managed to stop the invasion of the Russian army. I, I can give you a few stats that uh, I've been telling a lot of interviews. The Finnish army had 32 tanks. Just 32. The Russian army had 3,000. And uh, we had uh, 114 planes, and the Russian has almost 4,000 planes. Now, naturally, their manpower was at least three times to the Finnish one. So when you look at the statistics, it doesn't make any sense why they just didn't invade us in two days. But, but the uh, small Finnish army, again, not, not even a, like a professional army, we don't have this kind of like a war uh, history and background like uh, Russia has. They they are legendary, uh, like a war nation in a way with the Alexander Great and everything like yeah. everything of that. In the past, Finland just the farmers trying to protect their country. So not just our numbers, but uh, our skills as the soldiers were not in the same level. Of course, our perseverance. And, uh, and the will of power was clearly higher at least on, on, on that on those few months so, so that kind of like that's that's a very big part of the Finnish like uh, mentality what happened uh, on that war so it's, it's also like this um, kind of like a cultural thing even and so it is, it's a big thing for Finnish person a little bit difficult to explain maybe for outsider but it's a very Finnish thing to to honor the, that uh, short, short amount of uh, award that we fought. So it sounds like kind of just that idea of, despite 
all odds and adversity being being able to to fight back even when the deck is completely stacked against you that sort of yes. thing yes exactly and it, it brought brought really cool like uh cool heroes that are actually in in the like the the sniper white death his name was simo Hauha. he was uh he was from the neighbor village actually where i was born in a, in a very same region he did uh 500 kills during that three months of a uh, month of a war and uh he's still the deadliest sniper in the in the whole world when you look at the numbers and uh but he didn't use uh scope because he didn't want the sun to give the give his position away with the reflection of the scope so he was using the the old school crosshair and uh it was one of the coldest winters of that era so it, it was like minus 40 degrees in the worst days and nights and uh he was just sitting in his uh, uh, hole that he dug in the snow and he kept like hours and hours. That's what night snipers do. You, you find a position and then you just are stuck in there. And, and he held uh, ice or snow in his mouth. So the, the breath wasn't steaming and just sitting there. And, um, and he was also just a farmer, naturally very, very good shooter. He did, did go to the army. And when the war was over, he just went back to being a farmer. So it's just like very average, just regular guys became like a, one of the biggest heroes of Finland and also became like a, quite a remarkable names in the, in the war history even. Yeah, that's pretty remarkable. And I could kind of see like how th having that mentality – I mean, in a way, it kind of relates back to what we were talking about in the beginning with what, what yeah. we're dealing with with this virus right now. Like, you know, against all odds, having to, you know, just use what you've got to to be able to survive. Yeah, no, I, I think it's, uh, to me, it's been a little bit easier so far with the virus thing because uh, uh, it's uh, being so close with this uh, uh, theme. I was reading a lot of the stories of the veterans. I was listening a lot of the interviews. I wasn't just digging into the, the Wikipedia or just the statistic in the history. I was really listening to and reading about what the actual human beings in that war felt. So this feels a little bit smoother considering what that generation had to go through. So if, if I'm not allowed to go to, uh, to the bars or see my friends for a few months, and I can just sit home and watch Netflix. I'm gonna be okay, because I, I don't need to drag myself in the in the eastern border of Finland during the winter and just without even proper army uh, gears try to stop army that is ten times the size. So it it gives a boost. It did things in a little little bit different perspective also. Yeah, definitely, definitely not one and the same. But it just I I could see how like you said, having that sort of Finnish mentality would be helpful. But I do, one, one thing I do need to mention, not to, uh, I don't want to talk bad about our generation in Finland, but uh, what I've seen around me, like the past 10 years, and been observing, like, those veterans are the wolves of Karelia. That's where the name comes from. They were the, the wolves of that region. And since they are the wolves, and looking now our generation and how we are dealing things and handling stuff, we are only daddy bears on our best day. We are we have come quite far from that mentality. So maybe these kind of events puts that little like this kind of like a attitude back. Turning to kind of the musical quality itself, where do you find your main inspirations in terms of like the bands you listen to or just, you know, anywhere else that you might be getting it from? Uh, I don't really listen to music at all nowadays. I haven't had any musical system hooked up in my home for like 10 years or so. It's, it's, it doesn't really come from other other bands I, when I was uh, when I was growing up, I was a huge fan of, uh, especially Swedish melodic black metal. I don't know why it was so narrow, but uh, that 
that's like my musical roots. I, I think with the with our music getting faster, it's not just because I'm getting crumpier as a human <laughs> being. But it's also, I, I'm actually going more and more towards the roots where I started listening to metal music. Very aggressive, but very melodic uh, uh, kind of black metal style, even though we don't have this religious uh, thing going on at all. But music-wise, it's going there, so... Right. Right. Musically, I'm, I'm going towards my childhood idols, but uh, otherwise, it's just uh, I get a lot more inspiration from the nature, for example, than than from the other bands. From nature, like, uh, are you somebody who goes on like a lot of hikes, or tell me more about that? Yeah, well, I, I do spend a lot of times outdoors. I was uh, the village where I was born. I basically grew up surrounded by big forest and and a lot of lakes. So like every day was I was somehow connected with the nature, and um, I've been working as a gardener for 25 years now. I, I started that when I was 15. So I've been I literally planted several forests already in my lifetime. So I, I really like um, I like kind of like the the building the nature being around with stuff that grows. That's that's very important for me. Well, that's definitely a big topic right now, too. And I, <clears throat> I know both you uh, in terms of the, the press release I got, but myself, too. We don't want to get like overly political about it. But obviously, you know, conservation and nature and the ozone and all that stuff is like a hot topic right now. Yeah. So what do you find yourself doing? I mean, in a way, do you see your, your music as sort of a, a means to encourage that? Or is that just something that finds its way into just the inspiration? It's just the inspiration. I, I don't want to use my music or band as uh, any kind of platform for any kind of like uh, ideology or what I might have. I kind of just do that on my work because, uh, yeah. I, that's how I preserve nature is basically building it or yeah I got it it's, it's it's not my business to go teaching people and it yeah that's uh yeah so some, uh, yeah. somebody, uh, somebody uh, else can <laughs> handle that side but uh I I I do observe the the way of the world very very intensely and it it, it sucks how much we destroy the nature and how less the humankind in general actually cares about what we, the coral reefs and the ozone layer, the, the melting of the glaciers. And it's, we are just, it's like a doom desk clock that we build ourselves. So this, uh, yeah, we, we don't treat the nature with the respect it would need. Yeah. Definitely. Yeah. But I don't want to preach that subject uh, through my music. So, yeah. It's just it's just a source of inspiration, but I I have a I do have very like a, a lot of uh, what is the word opinions <laughs> Op opinion not just opinions it's like things I believe in and things I don't very much approve from other people's how they act but it's just I keep it much to myself yeah well and I honestly appreciate that because I will say I just get so kind of annoyed with not only musicians, but celebrities who are constantly like kind of getting up on a soapbox and sort of talking down to people about it. Cause to be honest, like I, I work in a field too, where I see, and I know from research that that's not an effective way to make change and to kind of move things along. And so I, I honestly respect people more when it's like, yeah, of course you have opinions, you have thoughts, you have values in terms of yourself and other people but as far as kind of like using that as a pulpit to lecture to people, yeah. and I get so sick of like even watching celebrities get on the Academy Awards and sort of wave their finger at people they perceive as sort of lower than them. I'm like, that's that's not the way to to, <laughs> you know, move us along as a society. I feel like that's a, just a, a, digging us deeper into the hole when uh what i what i respect a lot more is kind of what you're describing is like you see ways that you personally can help with the problem and so instead of thinking in a subtractive way of how can i you know 
punish other people for not doing things the way I would. You're thinking in terms of, okay, what can I do to help the problem personally at my level? And that, yeah. that, that, that is a problem of our generation now with the social media and stuff. It's a lot more important to, to build the image and actually do the things. It's, 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 it's get to say stuff and get to announce your uh, views of the world that make you look cool. But at the same time, you could actually do something like literally with your yeah. hands to change something like a, and um, and uh, there's a, another side that annoys me. Like there's there's a lot of uh, celebrities, uh, like movie stars and uh, people who actually do something, but it seems so clearly that they have the bigger bigger need to get to tell people what they did than actually just be happy about what they did. It's every a lot, a lot of things are just polishing your own image instead of actually just yes. <laughs> yeah. you, you can you can do a good thing and you don't need to mention that in Facebook. Yeah. <laughs> it's like, and, like and, uh... and to me too, the people who do that, the people who feel the need to constantly post on Instagram and Facebook of, Hey, look at this good thing that I'm doing. I'm like, okay, now you're making it about you though. Now yeah, it's I... not about the problem itself. You're, you're just focused on, look at me, what a good person I am and the responses you can get for that and how it makes you feel. Yeah, it, it's the image. You are just building the image. You are not actually probably not even that motivated to do anything. You just want to claim the points for yourself and uh, just make yourself look cooler. Yeah. Yeah, I'm I'm not about that. Like, I feel like one of the – some of the most formative experiences I had growing up were those sort of put-your-money-where-your-mouth-is things where it was like – you know, let's go out and do something constructive instead of complaining about the problem. I had multiple summers where we went out with Habitat for Humanity, which is, you know, a project where you go and you build houses for people who are less fortunate than you. And so we were all out there in the sun working with our hands, you know, putting up the walls, painting, all this stuff. Um, and And instead of making it about, like, you know, poverty and and all the people who are causing it and pointing fingers. It was like, hey, we can actually like help. <laughs> like we can go out and do something about it. And it was a very positive experience. And I feel like I it was that was always instilled in me to to you know just go out and do good and don't use it as a means to sort of virtue signal to everybody else, you know, how good yeah. you are. Just do it because it's the right thing to do. Yeah. Because that that becomes like a actual mentality. And and yeah, but it's a uh, people are weird nowadays. I <laughs> yes, they probably were back in when my parents were kids. I I, I wasn't around <laughs> at that time. I I'm pretty sure people have always been weird in d different ways. But I uh, yeah, it's making very simple things way too complicated. Yeah, just do good things and good things will follow. And uh, don't do good things and eventually everybody's gonna be fucked. Yeah, <laughs> I think you're right. I think people always have been weird. It's just that now with the internet and social media, it's just put a megaphone up to every yeah. one of those voices. And now it's just so much louder and constant and it's hard to escape. Exactly. Yeah. <laughs> well, what else can you share with me about, you know, the recording process, this pro process of this album, you know, other other things, plans you have in the pipe? Uh, yeah. What else? Um, I'm I'm gonna give you one as thorough answer as I can because I have another interview that was supposed to start two minutes ago. But I oh my bad, the... I didn't know how much time we had. So <laughs> yeah, we can wrap up. I I already wrote the guy that you. It's gonna take a few minutes. He's he's waiting and he's happy about it. So no stress about that. Okay. But uh, but yeah, there are. There is there's one thing that differs this album from any of the previous ones when it comes to the, the making of process because uh, after the constellation of the black light we played almost 140 gigs in 10 months so we were basically constantly on, on the road we did two European tours two North American tours South American tour uh, Russian and Asian tour and two tours in Finland with the smaller ones. So that was the first time in past 15 years that I wasn't writing constantly because that's what I usually do. I, I, I write just as a, as a 
strain of thought, and it, can, it means that there's songs coming all the time. Now, for 10 months, no songs at all. So when I came home from the studio uh, last August, I was like basically a balloon ready to explode. I have all the ideas in my head, no way to actually get them out. So I ended up writing the whole album in less than uh, one and a half months. Wow. It, it, it was just not just like sitting down and starting to write. I had a lot of stuff, like a huge amount of stuff already in my head. So it, uh, it came out insanely fast. It was uh, also probably the, the coolest album to write and record that I've ever done because it was actually my 20th album looking at all, like counting all my albums and bands. And uh, I never lot. be this. I, that's that just makes me old in my in my book. <laughs> but uh, it, it, the, I was so excited because I never took that long of a pause, and uh, and just to get back to actually writing and recording instead of being on the road. I love being on the road. One hundred forty gigs in ten months. That's a little bit too much being on the road, to be honest. Yeah, that's a lot. So, so it's uh. I was so, so, so excited to actually just get to write the stuff and, and record and, and build the new songs. So it was it was the most exciting album I've ever done because I was just so genuinely excited to get to do the thing that I love the most. But um, about the future plans, now that the album is coming out in one and a half weeks, we have none <laughs> because <laughs> everything was shut down. Well, we, we do have plans. But there's a lot of, uh, we're going to do a little bit more videos. We're going to, uh, gonna gonna start doing a lot of like this uh, probably this rehearsal uh, room jam videos uh, whatever we can think of like being keeping the connection with the fans and uh, just trying to do as much promo now that we can because there's a lot of free times in our hands and hopefully we get to start touring again in next September when we are supposed to do a headline in touring Europe and then. Uh, February, March, we're going to do the Devastation of the Nation tour that uh, was supposed to be taking place now. So I, I just hope it's, it's just going to be half a year pause and then things go back to normal. But like we covered in the beginning, nobody knows what's waiting when this yeah. whole thing was over. Yeah, but yeah. well... I, I, at this point, I'm, I'm going to thank you for the interview. It was really, really cool talk. Uh, not to put uh, things like different interviews in order, but one of the coolest ones so far. Uh, we get to talk more about the, the nature and the and, and the world and uh, playing people from <laughs> being okay, so. Hopeful. Yeah. That no, I, I, I've done it a long time. It was very, very nice talk, and I, I need to jump for the next one now. Yeah, yeah, I understand. Thank you so much for your time, and uh, good luck to you on all your future endeavors. Have a good one. Same to you. Bye. Bye. And that'll do it for another episode of Trench Talk. Hope you enjoyed it. Again, if you haven't already, please do subscribe to this channel. If you haven't already, you can listen to the podcast on Spotify, iTunes, CastBox, BitChute, and YouTube. And regardless of whichever platform you use, also subscribe to the YouTube channel because there is plenty of other content there. Album reviews, album roundups, uh, reaction videos tier lists, all, all sorts of fun stuff. So hop over there. Also, down in the description, you can find links to all of our social media accounts. Also, our email newsletter that I send out personally every Friday to keep you up to date with what's going on at MetalTrenches.com. And also, if you feel like you're getting added value out of these episodes and you're a returning listener, then by all means, you can find links there also to the Patreon and Subscribe Star. Just a dollar a month makes a huge difference in helping me cover my overhead costs and also just justifying the time that that I put into this, but I think that'll do it for now. Flight of Icarus signing off. I will see you in the trenches. Yeah.